Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, right now we will uh, discuss uh, major environmental policies in the United States and learn the various uh, regulations, uh, environmental regulations that were enacted uh, in the United States um, from 1969 all the way to uh, more or less the present and focus on the major ones. So the major environmental policies that we're discussing here are, uh, listed, are listed in this table. Uh, very briefly from 1969 uh, with the enaction of uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, we have had quite a lot of environmental uh, regulations such as the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endang Endangered Species Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Toxic Substances Control Act, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, to name some of the most important ones, and then wrapping up with CERCLA, Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act, and Federal Insecticides and Rodenticides Act. You can see from this list that many of the environmental laws and regulations were enacted in the early 1970s to mid 1970s, and then further um, were amended and revised in the mid 80s to mid 90s. So one of the most important environmental laws and regulations is the National Environmental Policy Act, also known as NEPA. It is one of the first laws ever written in the US that establishes the broad national frame framework for protecting our environment. Under NEPA, all federal agencies are to prepare detailed statements assessing the environmental impact of and alternatives to major federal actions significantly affecting the environment. These statements are commonly referred to as environmental impact statements, EIS, and environmental assessments, EA. In general, under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, the difference between EA, environmental assessments, and EIS, environmental impact assessments, is simple. The EA is a concise review document taking into account the purpose and need of the proposal, any alternatives, and a brief review of the impacted environment. And EA will either result in a finding of no significant impact, FONSI, or if significant, environmental impacts appear likely, which will trigger an EIS. The FONSI determination is made without consideration of any cumulative impacts or geographic context. An EIS, on the other hand, is a much more comprehensive document. An EIS requires everything an EA would require while also requiring a much more comprehensive discussion of the reasonable alternatives and a hard look at the cumulative impacts of the proposal, along with all existing and reasonable foreseeable future development within the project area. So, um, whenever there's a uh, project, the role of a federal agency in NEPA process depends on the agency's expertise and relationships to the proposed action or project. The agency carrying out the federal action is responsible for complying with the requirements of NEPA. In some cases, there may be more than one federal agency involved in the proposed action. In this situation, a lead agency is designated to supervise the preparation of the environmental analysis. Federal agencies together with state, tribal, or local agency may act as joint lead agencies as well. In this slide, you can see um, an environmental screening matrix for the transportation sector. The impacts listed are typical for, uh, of the project types. They may or may not pose an actual environmental issue to be resolved depending on the specifics of any given projects and its location. So for example, um, a proposal for a project in ports or harbors may pose significant impact to surface uh, water quality, air quality, fisheries, and industries, as well as socioeconomic impact. Um, on the other hand, uh, there may not be any impact or very sign uh, or insignificant impact in the resettlement or public health. 
On the other hand, proposal of an airport uh, project may pose significant air quality uh, and noise issues, as well as resettlement and socioeconomic issues. Um, so you can view uh, this uh, matrix and understand how various projects, in this case, more or less related to transportation sectors, may affect different aspects of the environment, uh, either significantly or moderately or insig insignificantly. So this is the purpose of NEPA to be able to make such assessment uh, of any proposed projects. Now let's move to the Clean Air Act or CAA. The Clean Air Act or CAA is the comprehensive federal law that regulates air emissions from stationary and mobile sources. Among other things, this law authorizes EPA to establish national ambient air quality standards or NAAQS or NOx in short, to protect public health and public welfare and to regulate emissions of hazardous air pollutants. The Clean Water Act or CWA establishes the basic structure for regulating discharges of pollutants into the waters of the United States and regulating quality standards for surface water. Again, the key in here is surface water. CWA applies only to surface water, such as rivers, lakes, estuaries, coastal waters, and wetlands. The law gave EPA the authority to set affluent technology-based standards and continued the requirements to set water quality standards for all contaminants in surface water waters. The CWA makes it unlawful for any person to discharge any pollutant from a point source into navigable waters unless a permit is obtained under the Act. The Clean Water Act has succeeded in regulating, has succeeded uh, in regulating uh, point sources of pollution. Non-point source pollution is a major challenge since the sources are diffuse and varied, including atmospheric deposition, which is an example of non-point source. Um, as well as chemicals of concern often degrade into a series of byproducts. So when you have non-point sources such as rainfall or, um, uh, or dust um, um, that may drain into, uh, into a runoff, uh, this runoff can uh, pollute the water from various parts. Also, when you have a pesticide application, the pesticides can quickly uh, dissolve into the runoff and then uh, from rainfall, and then the runoff can lead to pollution of waterways in, uh, as a non-point source. Next, let's review the Safe Drinking Water Act. So in the US, the average person uses 100 gallons of drinking water per day. Of the drinking water supplied by public water systems, only a small portion is actually used for drinking. We use most water for other purposes, such as flushing toilets, bathing, cooking, cleaning, and watering lawns. However, this water must meet strict drinking water quality standards as set by the Safe Drinking Water Act, or SWA, or SDWA. The Safe Drinking Water Act protects the quality of drinking water in the United States. It focuses on all waters actually or potentially designated for drinking use, whether from above ground or underground sources. Under this act, the US EPA is authorized to establish national enforceable health standards for contaminants in drinking water. SDWA originally passed in 1974 and focused on treatment as the means of providing safe drinking water. In 1996, it was further amended um, um, to add important components by recognizing source water protection, operator training, funding for water system improvements, and public information. The next uh, law that we'll discuss is Endangered Species Act, also known as ESA. The Endangered Species Act, or ESA, provides a program for the conservation of threatened and endangered plants and animals and the habitats in which they're found. Endangered species are those at risk of extinction. Threatened species, on the other hand, are those at risk of becoming endangered in the, fu in, in the future. The lead federal agencies for implementing ESA are 
mostly to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, FWS, and the U.S. National Oceanic and, Atmosp and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, Fisheries and Ser uh, Fisheries Services under NOAA. The um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or FWS, uh, maintains a a worldwide list of endangered species. Species in this list include birds, insects, fish, reptiles, mammals, as well as crustaceans, flowers, grasses, and trees. And you can see that uh, it, uh, this list uh, has 632 endangered species, among them 326 are plants, and 190 threatened species, and among them 78 are plants. Uh, this law requires federal agencies in consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and or NOAA Fisheries Service to ensure that actions they authorize, fund, or carry out are not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of any listed species or result in the destruction or adverse modifications of designated critical habitats of such species. The Toxic Substances Control Act, pronounced as TUSCA, provides EPA with authority to require reporting, record keeping, and testing requirements and restrictions related to chemical substances and or mixtures. TUSCA addresses the production, importation, use, and disposal of specific chemicals, including polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, asbestos, radon, and lead-based paint, to name a few. EPA tracks more than 83,000 industrial, um, industrial chemicals currently produced or imported into the United States. As new chemicals are commercially manufactured or imported in the United States, they are placed on this list. EPA repeatedly screens these chemicals and can require reporting or testing of those that may pose an environmental or human health hazard and can ban the manufacture and import of those chemicals that pose an unreasonable risk. Certain substances are generally excluded from TASCA, including among others, food, drugs, and cosmetics, which falls under FDA or USDA, depending on which one we are talking about. We will now shift to uh, management of hazardous waste, and we introduce two specific environmental laws, such as the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RICRA, and then CERCLA um, uh, after following RICRA. Both of these uh, environmental uh, laws, RICRA and CERCLA, they apply to hazardous waste, principally. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, pronounced as RICRA, gives EPA the authority to control hazardous waste from cradle to grave. This includes the generation, transportation, treatment, storage, and disposal of hazardous waste. Do pay attention to the term cradle to grave, uh, which essentially designate that US EPA will follow a specific hazardous chemical from the generation cradle all the way to this disposal grave. And uh, the purpose in here is to ensure that there's no, um, no environmental release of such pollutants because you'll be able to follow that uh, pollutant uh, through a manifest system, through a tracking system from beginning to end of its life cycle or cradle to grave. Um, and as I've just mentioned, this includes the generation, transportation, treatment, storage, and disposal of hazardous waste. In addition to hazardous waste, it also addresses environmental problems that could result from underground storage tanks containing petroleum and other hazardous substances. RICRA focuses only on active and future facilities and does not address abandoned or historical sites, which will be the goal of CERCLA and we'll discuss next. So CERCLA stands for Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. CERCLA, uh, prov uh, also known as Superfund, uh, provides a federal superfund to clean up uncontrolled or abandoned hazardous waste sites, as well as accident spills and other emergency releases of pollutants and contaminants. 
contaminants into the environment. Through, through CERCLA, EPA uh, was given the power to seek out those parties responsible for any release and assure their cooperation in the cleanup. It is important to note the difference between RICRA and CERCLA. So RICRA again applies to active sites, whereas CERCLA applies to abandoned sites. In both cases, uh, both CERCLA and RICRA, RICRA applies uh, to hazardous waste or hazardous chemicals. So EPA cleans up orphan sites when potentially responsible party cannot be identified or like located uh, or when they fail to act. So this act, CERCLA, gives EPA that authority to act to clean up such sites. Through various, through various enforcement tools, EPA obtains private party cleanup through orders, consent decrees, and other small party settlements. EPA also recovers cost from financially viable individuals and companies once a response action has been completed. EPA is authorized to implement the act in all 50 states and US territories. Superfund sites identification, monitoring, and response activities in states are coordinated through the state environmental protection or waste management agencies. And the name Superfund is important uh, because it is like it is able to gather a pot of money from taxpayers and use a portion uh, for uh, funding this cleanup. And because it is coming from taxpayers and the significant funds involved, um, it is known as Superfund. So SARA or Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act. Um, passed on October 17, 1986, and it amends the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act or CERCLA or Superfund. Um, so CERCLA was passed in 1980 and SARA was passed six years later. And the goal of SARA was to really help to solve problems of hazardous waste sites. A shortage of uh, funds for Superfund initiated the passage of SARA. SARA legislation includes a tax on chemical and petroleum industries and provides the federal government with the power to respond directly to releases or threatened releases of hazardous substances that could harm public health or the environment. SARA increased the Superfund Trust Fund by $8.5 billion and reinforced the importance of uh, human health, community, community involvement, cooperation with state and local laws and authorities and permanent solutions to hazardous waste cleanup. Under SARA, the US Environmental Protection Agency is required to assess the degree of risk to human and environmental health at sites on the Superfund's National Priority List or NPL. The NPL includes toxic waste sites around the country that are subject to Superfund legislation. Thus, SARA provides with the resources needed to clean up hazardous waste sites, as well as emergency plans to follow in case of a dangerous substance release. So SARA is kind of acting to supplement the CERCLA and RICRA laws. Finally, um, we will uh, discuss uh, FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, uh, under this, uh, this act provides for federal regulation of pesticide distribution, sale and use. All pesticides distributed or sold in the United States must be registered or licensed by EPA. Before EPA may uh, register a pesticide under FIFRA, the applicant must show, among other things, that using the pesticide, according to specifications, will not generally cause unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. FIFRA defines the term unreasonable effects on the environment to mean any reasonable risk to man or the environment, taking into account the economic, social, and environmental costs and benefit of the use of any pesticides, or two, a human dietary risk from residues that result from a use of a pesticide in or on any food inconsistent, um, in or any food inconsistent with the standard under section 408 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. 
So um, uh, uh, farmers are required to register. Farmers and utility companies that are used pesticide are required to register when purchasing pesticides. And uh, uh, under this act, pesticides must be properly labeled. Um, so uh, the potential health hazard can be communicated to consumers. So now summarizing uh, major environmental policies in the United States. You've already seen this table before, but a new column has been added in here, which is the primary agency or authority. And uh, you can note the various uh, environmental policies and the agencies that are uh, leading the effort for implementing and enforcing those respective environmental laws and regulations. Again, summarizing um, the various environmental laws and regulations, you can see which of these laws and regulations focuses on restoration and remediations, which ones uh, focuses on protection and conservation, and which ones have a more socio-ecological uh, perspective in mind. So CERCLA, CERA, FIFRA, NEPA, and RICRA uh, have a strong restoration and remediation component, uh, whereas FIFRA and SWDA, which is the Safe Drinking Water Act, have a socio-ecological component um, embedded into its laws and regulations. And the protection and conservation uh, are ensured by the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, the um, um, Endangered Species Act, as well as RICRA and NEPA. And you can see that NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, overlaps all three different components. So hopefully this uh, lecture was useful in introducing you to the various environmental laws and regulations in the United States. Um, please do not forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you.